One of the fundamental challenges faced by utility tokens is providing the incentive for users to actually hold onto or use the platform's token. Holding is more a function of the underlying tokenomics, while use depends on how compelling the platform's value proposition is to its target users. This challenge became very apparent in the 2016-2017 ICO boom, where countless numbers of utility tokens failed to hold their value. The reluctance of users to hold onto a platform's native token is very likely a consequence of the velocity problem, especially when these tokens act like independent monetary bases. Velocity is a variable in the equation of exchange that represents how frequently an asset changes hands. One incorrect but reasonable assumption many people make is that the value of a token that is required to pay for a product or service is directly proportional to the quantity of products or services that are sold on that platform. In other words, people expect that price will scale with adoption. While it is true that adoption is needed to add value, it does not guarantee value. For example, you can imagine a utility token that's required to buy lottery tickets. Unless the platform provides some additional incentive to hold that, their native token, like loyalty points or staking rewards, then the only reason to hold the token, outside of short-term speculation, is to buy a lottery ticket. In other words, a person will immediately buy a lottery ticket once they acquire the native token, and the length of time that native token is held is a function of friction. Friction is a measure of how difficult it is for a buyer to exchange a token for a service or for a service provider to exchange a token for some more preferable store of value like Bitcoin or fiat currency. Friction is inversely proportional to velocity, which means that a token will change hands more frequently as it becomes easier to exchange the token. And finally, because there's no incentive to hold a token and a strong selling pressure to get rid of it as soon as possible, tokens that have a high velocity tend to lose their value over time. To better understand the impact of velocity on utility tokens, it helps to look at the entire equation of exchange, which we'll modify a little bit to make it more relevant to our industry. This equation can be expressed as M times V equals P times Q, where M is a market cap of the utility token, V is the frequency at which the token changes hands, also known as velocity, P is the average price of goods or services, and Q is the quantity of goods and services, all within a certain time period. The left side of the equation represents the total amount of tokens spent within a platform, while the right side represents the total price of goods or services that are bought within that platform. And you can rearrange the equation such that V equals P times Q over M and see that high velocity will cause an asset to be devalued, while low velocity will result in difficulty liquidating the asset. The major problem with utility tokens is high velocity because people often lack the incentive to hold on to a token in a relatively frictionless environment. Therefore, many projects seek to reduce velocity and find ways to make the value of their token directly proportional to adoption. Only two tokenomics models have managed to do this, which include the work token model and the burn and mint equilibrium or BME model. The work token model that was pioneered by the betting platform Augur is relatively straightforward. Tokens are staked by a service provider to earn the right to perform work for the platform. The more tokens staked, the more likely it is that a service provider will be awarded a job. Stakers can also receive payment in the form of a yield, which may come from transaction fees or a tax on the holders. Conversely, the platform may slash or reduce the stake of service providers if they don't meet certain standards. Because the work token model captures a lot more value than other token models, it should be implemented by any utility token that is offering a pure commodity. However, the BME model, which also addresses a velocity problem, is preferable for a more comprehensive DeFi platform that allows service providers to set their own prices and compete with other businesses on a variety of things like marketing or customer service. Factum, the predecessor of Accumulate, was a pioneer of the BME model that they implemented in 2015. In 2017, Multicoin Capital performed a valuation and analysis of Factum's dual token BME model and described it as one of the most well-designed systems they ever studied. Since then, other protocols implemented similar designs. Helium, which experienced massive growth and widespread adoption over the past couple of years, borrowed heavily from Factum in designing their tokenomics model 
and is now in the top 50 coins by market cap. Accumulate, which is the hard fork of Factum, also implements the BME model. However, Accumulate will use delegated proof of stake as opposed to Factum's proof of authority. It'll reward validators with a majority of its inflation, have a capped maximum supply, and also utilize a different governance structure to address some of the issues that Factum encountered. Accumulate utilizes a dual token model that Factum was also the first to use in the blockchain industry. There's the native Acme coin, whose price can fluctuate depending upon market conditions, and non-tradable, non-transferable utility tokens with a fixed price called credits. Acme is burned to create credits, and credits are used to pay for services on the Accumulate network. Any Acme that is burned will return to the unissued pool to be minted in future blocks. Every year, in increments of one month, 16% of Acme in the unissued pool is minted and given primarily to stakers and validators as a reward for securing the network. As network usage grows, the burn rate of Acme will increase and fewer Acme will remain in the circulating supply for that minting period. Because Accumulate has staking, increased network usage will incentivize the lockup of Acme in staking pools and drive Acme towards a deflationary model. To see how it works, we'll calculate the number of transactions per month that are needed to support an Acme price of $1 per token in the absence of speculation. So the cost of credits is fixed at one cent. And to keep things simple, we'll assume that 1 million Acme are minted per month. Accumulate supports many transaction types and has different fees for things like data transactions, token transactions, scratch data transactions, ADI creation, token issuance, and key updates. For example, a data transaction will cost 0.1 cents and ADI creation will cost $5. When these transaction types are weighted based on expected use, we get an average cost of 1.5 cents per transaction. This means that 1.5 credits, on average, are needed per transaction. Finishing up our example, we see that a token price of $1 is supported by approximately 25 transactions per second. In reality, however, speculation will likely be the major contributor to the value of Acme early on. The value proposition of Accumulate's BME model is realized for enterprises uh, who want a predictable cost model, cannot legally hold cryptocurrency, and need the flexibility to price their own services. Because the price of credits is fixed and tied to the US dollar, enterprise users and IoT devices are able to budget their expenses long term without having to worry about market conditions. Because credits are non-tradable and non-transferable, they're treated more as a product than a security allowing a wider range of business use, use cases to use the Accumulate network. <clears throat> and finally, despite not capturing as much value as the work token model, the BME model allows Accumulate to integrate with any service or platform, even if it isn't a pure commodity. Mm -hmm.